Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk about air pollution basically. So we're going to uh, continue looking at actual research papers now, as opposed to sort of discussing uh, econometric theory or uh, economic theory. Um, in terms of the midterm, the, I would say that the coverage of the midterm will be up through uh, like Friday's lecture. So the stuff that we talk about today and the rest of the week uh, will not be on the midterm, which will be not this coming Wednesday, but the following Wednesday after that. Yes, uh, last Friday being the like fifth or whatever, just three days ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the VSL stuff could be on midterm. Okay, uh, and again, for those of you who weren't here on Friday, uh, I'll pass out some like uh, sample questions from previous midterms, and we will go over those either on this Friday or uh, the Monday a week from now. But I think probably more likely on this Friday, so you have a little bit of time to study some more. Okay, so air pollution and health. Um, I think air pollution is sort of the textbook example of an externality. Uh, when we say air uh, pollution, often I think air pollution is really what comes to mind. This might be because uh, airborne pollutants have the greatest uh, potential for dispersal. So if you think about sort of what are the other potential types of pollution, uh, one would be, I guess, land pollution. So that would just be kind of garbage in general, or maybe sort of more, uh, more realistically like toxic waste sites or something like that, Superfund sites. Um, so those, you certainly wouldn't want to live next to a Superfund site, uh, but you know, the dispersion is pretty limited there. If you were sort of living like a couple miles away from a toxic waste site, you probably wouldn't be too concerned about getting contamination from it. Whereas uh, if you're living a couple miles away from a floating factory or something, you can still imagine that you're going to receive a lot of pollution from that. Because of that, then sort of the external costs are uh, greater, or the, the share of external costs uh, that are being borne by the individual uh, that pollutes uh, is very small. So um, uh, in the case of air pollution, sorry. Uh, in the case of land pollution, then it's going to be the opposite that the individual who's polluting there would potentially bear a large share of the pollution costs. Although, you know, if you're thinking about a site, presumably like the corporation or the people who own that site do not actually live at that site and thus do not uh, experience the pollution themselves. Uh, but nevertheless, it'll be easier to sort of figure out who exactly is doing the polluting in those cases. Uh, water pollution has uh, certainly a greater potential for dispersal than uh, pollution that's fixed on land, because of course water is uh, a solvent and you can the pollution get mixed in there. Uh, but it's still going to be limited to say individuals who live adjacent to the water, as long as you're not talking about drinking water contamination. Um, so, uh, river pollution, I think, was a, a pretty big problem uh, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, uh, and that's one of the things that the Clean Water Act uh, has addressed. But even back then, you know, to the extent that the river is very polluted. Uh, um, it's only people who are living right near the river who are going to be affected, uh, except insofar as the drinking water is coming from, um, from the river. In, but in comparison to those two things, airborne pollutants basically affect uh, everybody within a given area. So there's no real way to avoid that by sort of moving away from the dump or moving away from a uh, uh, waterway. And so because of this fact, uh, I think air pollution is basically a case in which the Coast Theorem will almost surely fail. So in any case where you're looking at air pollution, there are going to be a very large number of negotiating parties because there are a very large number of people who are being uh, affected. So it's very unlikely that private negotiations are going to yield uh, some sort of optimal solution. You're not going to be able to sort of get all of the affected parties together in a room and have them work out some sort of deal after you assign property rights to, to some of the parties. Um, so because of that, government intervention is basically uh, a necessity if you want to actually try to attack this problem. Uh, but knowing what the, what, sort of what the optimal government intervention should be uh, is going to depend on how large the externality actually is uh, and how dangerous it is. So how much pollution is actually being created, and then how dangerous is that pollution to human health. And that turns out to be a very difficult question to actually answer. And uh, the takeaway message is going to be that we have evidence that it's dangerous, but pinning down the exact magnitude, I think, is, is not... Uh, I think that's still an ongoing research question, uh, because it's just... It's a case in which it's hard to sort of get... Um, a good research design, so that's like a research design where you think that a level of pollution is being sort of as good as randomly assigned and is not correlated with other potential confounding factors that, that might influence the results. Um, so this is, of course, an empirical question. I mean, there are sort of models of you know, how the human body works and so how uh, particles, like very small particles, inhale might be dangerous. Um, but trying to use those models to figure out what the ultimate sort of effect of air pollution uh, is, I think, is kind of like a that's, that's not something that you can realistically expect from those models. We don't know with enough precision exactly how the human body works to be able to say uh, this is what the effect of breathing pollution for ten years is going to be or anything like that. Um, so just to sort of motivate it, here's a, a uh, slide showing pollution in the Los Angeles area, uh, which of course is famous for being uh, a highly polluted area. At one point, was the most highly polluted area in the United States, although I think other areas like Houston have now overtaken it, uh, in part because uh, California does have very aggressive regulations to cut down on air pollution, which have been successful. Um, and what you can see here actually is what we call uh, the inversion layer. So in general, we're not going to talk about too much uh, real science in this class as opposed to social science, but, uh, but this will be one of the, the few exceptions. So the inversion layer is basically, well, it's a layer that basically traps pollution, uh, and that's one of the reasons why Los Angeles uh, has very bad pollution. Um, and the idea behind the inversion layer is basically as follows, uh, if I can explain correctly. So typically, as you go up, so this is like ground level. So typically, as you go up in elevation, um, the, the outside temperature, the temperature of the air gets cooler, right? So uh, if you ever like climbed up a mountain, that's probably something you experienced, that it was cooler at the top than when you started at the bottom, although you yourself might be kind of warm because of the exertion of climbing. Uh, and also, if you were to, like most extreme case would be, if you were to like open up a, a window on a commercial airliner when it's at 35,000 feet, uh, what you find is something like negative 40 degrees outside there, even if it's like 100 degrees down on like wherever it is, Oklahoma, wherever you're, you're flying uh, above, uh, even if it's 100 degrees there at ground level. Um, and so basically, I guess if you were to, uh, if you were to plot um, the, so this is, this is at ground level, so if you were to plot like the relationship between uh, altitude and temperature, uh, it would be basically like a negative uh, relationship. So the higher you get, the lower the temperature uh, is going to be, and the lower you get, the higher the temperature is going to be. Um, but something weird happens uh, at nighttime, which is that this relationship can actually get inverted for, uh, for a, sort of a small range of it. And the, the idea here is that essentially what happens is um, the sun is going to shine on the ground for you know, 12 or 14 hours or something like that. Then it's nighttime. Uh, then what happens is the air starts to cool off very quickly because it has a lower specific heat capacity, whereas the ground has a relatively high specific heat capacity. So the ground can actually sort of stay warmer than the outside air at midnight or something like that. Uh, and so the ground basically has a warming effect on the, um, on the air that's, that's right above it. And that tends to keep that air uh, somewhat warmer than actually. So now I think I'm describing it the opposite way, which is that it has to get uh, colder. So I guess the, it must be the case, this is why we want to do science. Um, it must be the case that the uh, ground then cools off quicker than the air. 
I see you're agreeing with that statement there. Uh, so the ground cools off quicker than the air, um, and what that means is then it's actually cooling the air at this rate of it rather than keeping it warmer. Uh, this won't be on the test, by the way. And so, so what happens then is that norms are normally you think, okay, as I, get, as I go up, it's going to get colder. Um, it actually gets a little bit warmer uh, as you go up because the, because the ground is having this cooling effect. And so basically, if we were to draw this curve, then it sort of like inverts uh, at the low altitudes um, so that, or sorry, it would look more like that. Uh, so that basically, as you get very low near the ground, the temperature is actually a little bit cooler than when you were to, if you were to go up like 100 or 200 feet. And so because of that, so that, what that basically means is that um, the, uh, the, there's sort of this layer that, that traps pollution uh, at a relatively low level. And as you can imagine, if it's being trapped instead of dispersing, that's going to mean that the concentrations are higher. So the practical effect of this, uh, which they found in the Los Angeles area where they've done studies of, um, of uh, pollution levels both the time of day and looking like near roadways and so forth, is that if you were to look at, say, like 5 a.m. in the morning, the, uh, the um, pollution levels then would actually be for certain types of, of pollutants, uh, would actually be higher than at, say, like um, 12 noon or 3 in the afternoon. And that might seem a little bit surprising because you think, like, well, you know, uh, especially if you're looking at your highways, which is what they're looking at, that a lot of the pollution is coming from uh, cars and, and light trucks and so forth, which is, which is the case. Uh, and you think, well, you know, 5 a.m. or like 3 a.m. in the morning or something, there aren't that many vehicles on the road, you think it would be really bad at like 10 a.m. or noon or something after like a whole bunch of vehicles had just driven by. And the, the, the reason why that's not the case is basically because of this inversion layer. So this, the fact that, that you get this layer that traps pollution is, um, that's, that's sort of more important actually than the total number of vehicles that are, uh, that are on the road at any given time. So when there's no layer, then the, the pollution can disperse uh, reasonably widely. Uh, but when there is a layer, uh, then it gets trapped at like 100 feet or 200 feet uh, above the ground. Um, and supposedly, I haven't tried this myself, um, in part because I don't usually get that early, but the, the atmospheric guys that I've talked to uh, here in College of Natural Resources say that if you were to go up to like Grizzly Peak, uh, so just up on the hill over there, and wait at like sunrise, uh, you would actually see this in effect. So essentially, you'd sort of see this layer that's above San Francisco, uh, which would be seen to kind of be trapped by something, even though you can't visibly see uh, something that's covering up San Francisco. Uh, and then as the sun came up and it started to warm up, uh, the ground started to warm up, and so it was no longer cooling down the air that's right, right above it. Uh, what you would find is that suddenly, in maybe a period of only like 10 or 15 minutes, uh, that entire layer would just disperse, and then things would look much clearer. So, sorry. Uh, so my understanding is then the pollution just, I mean, so it was trapped at, like, say, below 100 feet, and then it just uh, can now mix up to, to much higher altitudes. And so the overall the concentration then at that, like, 0 to 100 foot level uh, becomes much lower. Um, okay, so that's, that's why, that's why uh, certain types of pollution, like particulate pollution, can be uh, worse actually at night than during the day. Um, but, but that's not true of all types of pollution. So another type of pollution is uh, ozone, which is something that the federal government um, sort of, uh, targets specifically in regulations. And ozone is a very different type of pollutant. So, like, particulate pollutants uh, are things that typically are, like, what you think was just being emitted directly from the tailpipe and then... Um, and then they just kind of disperse. So it would sort of be like your, uh, I think probably like what your default or canonical model of a pollutant would be. Uh, but there are other pollutants that basically require, uh, require some additional reactions before they actually become pollutants. Uh, so basically ozone forms from reactions between sunlight and uh, pollutants that are, that are um, uh, emitted from uh, car tailpipes, I think particularly like nitrous oxides. And so what happens is that those, so you get something that's released from cars, it's not ozone, uh, but it, it gets released into the air. Uh, and then at like three in the afternoon or something, well, I guess it's starting nine in the morning, but throughout the day, uh, the sun will, will hit these, uh, these pollutants. And then the reaction between uh, the sunlight and the pollutants will form ozone, which then itself is, is harmful uh, as a pollutant. So that's kind of like a very different type of pollutant uh, in the sense that if you were to think about like standing right next to a car, um, so if you're standing right next to a car, you could be affected by things like carbon monoxide, which is directly emitted from the car, and things like um, uh, particulates, which also would be directly emitted. You wouldn't be affected by ozone though. So ozone, like what would really matter then is sort of the overall level of the uh, 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 I think it's nitrous oxides and other, there's something else I forget exactly, uh, but some other like uh, hydrocarbons that basically require to then react with sunlight, uh, which will then form ozone. So like being right next to a car, right next to a highway wouldn't actually affect your ozone level because it just depends on the overall levels of these things in the atmosphere and then requiring pictures of sunlight. So ozone is a, is a pollutant where basically like you don't find very much of it at night because obviously there's no sunlight so the reaction doesn't occur. Um, and it's only particular types of days that, that uh, you'll find it. So you, like you might have noticed when we have spare the air days, they're often during the summer, and that's because the thing that's most likely to trigger them uh, is ozone, and that, that can only really get formed in large quantities in the summer because you need sufficient amount of sunlight. Um, and then sometimes we'll spare the air days in the winter, uh, and at that point, it's not because of ozone, it's either because of, um, well, I think usually it's because of particulate pollution. So part of that is that, so some pollutants are uh, more common during the, the winter. So uh, for example, I believe carbon monoxide, which is emitted from vehicles, is more common during the winter because of uh, changes in combustion. Um, but uh, something else that's actually pretty common is just kind of like particulates from burning uh, of wood, which I think we mentioned earlier in the class. I had like a colleague who lived right next to somebody who used a wood burning stove. Uh, and that turns out to be like a major source of uh, pollutants just because wood burning stoves basically have no pollution control equipment attached to them. So even though you think of it as kind of being like a kind of natural heat source or something, it actually turns out to be one of the dirtiest heat sources you can actually uh, find. And so that's why you'll have these spare the areas in the winter, basically, uh, where the, the air quality district in the area is saying you cannot burn uh, wood in your fireplace, and if you do, you will be fine. Okay, so there's lots of different types of pollution, uh, but even sort of getting a handle on sort of generically what the effects of air pollution are on, uh, on health is very difficult. Uh, I mean, we know sort of in the extreme case, if you expose people to incredible amounts of pollution, such as like cigarette smoking, then you will eventually uh, suffer from adverse consequences, at least in expectation. Uh, but, you know, people aren't breathing air, I don't know, maybe in China they are, but uh, in the U.S. people aren't breathing air that sort of comes close to, to even like the, uh, the dirtiness of secondhand smoke, let alone like actual uh, first-hand smoke. So there's several studies that we'll, we'll talk about, uh, and all these studies kind of come to the same conclusion, but they have sort of differing, um, they, they have different research designs, uh, which is a positive because that means you're sort of looking at different pieces of evidence and they're telling you a similar story. Uh, but they're also they also sort of look at different um, pollutants in a different context and even different outcomes in terms of like who's being affected. Um, so I'm just going to try to sort of summarize overall what the literature is here uh, by talking about several studies in a little bit more depth. Uh, so the first study that, that's on the syllabus, I think, is this one by uh, Ken Jay and, and Michael Greenstone, where they study the impact of air pollution on infant health. So it turns out that a lot of this stuff focuses on infant health or uh, even on like um, sort of. Uh, uh, pre-infant or gestational health in the sense that
you know, killing baby, like dead babies or like they're sad. So there's sort of an emotional appeal there. Uh, but another is that um, if you're thinking about sort of what the lifetime exposure to air pollution is, then if you think about an infant, you could actually imagine cases where you look at a relatively short run change in air pollution, and that's going to have uh, that's going to basically expose that infant to uh, a much higher level of pollution over its entire lifespan because its entire lifespan is so short. Whereas if you're trying to look at like the effect of air pollution on a 50 year old person, then it's going to be hard to sort of find variations in air pollution that actually correspond to changing that person's exposure to air pollution for decades and decades, right? Um, <laughs> So I think that's why that's another reason why a lot of studies sort of focus on like infant health and birth weight and stuff like that. So we'll talk about several of those studies. This was kind of one of the first ones uh, in the econ literature that that uh, looked at that. There, so to sort of set the background, I think that for a long time it's, it's been pretty well established or known that uh, what you would think was maybe a radically elevated uh, level of air pollution is bad for human health. So there's something called the Great Smog in 1952, uh, which occurred in London when there was um, essentially sort of one of these inversion layers, but you know it was like an English inversion layer, so it's like 100 times worse than, than here because we know that London is always kind of dreary and smoggy and cloudy and, and the air never really circulates there. Uh, and that was basically what happened. Plus this was sort of before they had any like pollution control regulations because it was back in like 1950 and they're all burning coal and who knows what. Um, and so there was this, this smog that. that uh, that just hung over the city for days, uh, and when they sort of look at it in retrospect, they can actually see just very clear evidence from the death records that, that, uh, that total uh, mortality had, had spiked during those days. Um, but those levels are rarely found in at least developed countries uh, today, so it's probably not so instructive for what you might expect to sort of find in the United States or in other European countries. Um, so we can look at sort of epidemiological evidence that looks at uh, the correlation between air pollution exposure and infant mortality. And if you do that, you would tend to find that there's a positive correlation. Uh, but all that's telling you is essentially that like people who live in more polluted neighborhoods tend to have higher infant mortality. And if you look at the demographic characteristics of those people, they also tend to uh, uh, be skewed towards things that would be correlated with higher mortality, so like lower income and so forth. Um, and so figuring out uh, how much of that correlation represents a causal effect and how much of it is due to these unobserved factors like socioeconomic status and population density and so forth uh, can be pretty difficult. Now, of course, you might think, well, you know, we talked about regression analysis, so couldn't you run a regression where you control for things like the uh, income in the, the uh, in that neighborhood is, is measured by the census and population density? Of course, you could uh, measure with the census and so forth. And that's true. Uh, and if you do that, then you'll tend to usually find that the estimates of your that the correlation that you estimate between um, uh, pollution levels and mortality is going to fall. But the question is, you know, there are other factors as well that you probably can't measure or can't observe. Uh, and by not accounting for those factors, uh, are you still ending up with some some bias in your estimate? So. What Shane Greenstone do uh, is they use this uh, recession that happened back in the early 80s as such a natural experiment that changes air pollution levels. Um, so the idea is that at that time, at least, back when the U.S. had more manufacturing, uh, um, uh, manufacturing was a, was a uh, significant determinant of overall uh, pollution levels. So if you get a recession that hits manu the manufacturing se uh, sector very, uh, like, uh, has a big impact on it, you could potentially see uh, changes in air pollution levels. Uh, and in particular, what you're going to find is that places that are sort of manufacturing intensive that have you know, a lot of manufacturing jobs are going to see larger changes in air pollution levels, and uh, places that, that are sort of uh, less manufacturing intensive uh, are going to see smaller changes. So they use this recession. Uh, uh, to um, estimate the effect of uh, a reduction in what they call TSP, which is uh, total suspended particulates. And this reduction is occurring because polluting industries are shutting down in the recession. So, you know, overall, we think of recessions as being bad things, and they are. Uh, but this is sort of like the silver lining is that, hey, you know, you got a bunch of polluted industries shutting down, uh, and so pollution levels fell, at least in some of these counties. And crucially for their research design, uh, the reductions in these TSPs vary widely across counties. So if you just have the exact same reduction in TSPs across all counties, then you could kind of do some sort of maybe event type study of you know, looking at what uh, overall fatality or overall infant mortality rates were before the recession and then what they were after the recession. Uh, but you're probably concerned that there's other things that are changing in the background over time uh, that also affect infant mortality rates. Certainly we know the technology is getting better over time, for example. Uh, and so you would expect infant mortality rates to be falling just because of that reason alone. Um, and so... But so what they have though in their case is that there are actually some uh, counties that have big reductions in TSPs because they have, they're very uh, industry intensive or manufacturing intensive, and then there's some counties that have pretty small reductions in TSPs. And so you can think of basically what they're doing is they're using these counties that, that have lower uh, reductions in TSPs as like control counties for the counties that have big reductions in total suspended particulates. Um, so in this case, we'll call the treated counties are those with high density of polluting industries, so they see large reductions, and then uh, the control counties are going to be those with a low uh, density of polluting industries. So you can think of those as being the uh, first ones treated, and then the second one is the control. So then they can implement a distant type uh, design and compare the changes in infant mortality uh, due to what we call internal causes. So basically, that's like excluding things like uh, accidents and um, and like, homicides as well, uh, but things due to external causes. Um, so they can look at uh, changes in infant mortality due to internal causes in counties with large TSP reductions and compare how uh, those changes compare to um, the changes in infant mortality in counties that have uh, relatively small TSP reductions. And the basic finding that they, they see is, is as follows: so a one percent decrease in uh, particulates is associated with, uh, with about a zero point three five percent decrease uh, in infant mortality rates. So you know, talking, saying whether something is large or small is always sort of subjective. It depends on what your comparison is. But I would characterize that as a fairly large uh, effect. You know, if you're thinking about just changing one factor, which in this case is pollution, uh, and you're finding an elasticity in the range of 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 there, um, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty big. Uh, certainly price elasticities, are, there are many price elasticities that are not that big. And we certainly think that price is one of the most important determinants and uh, demand for, for goods. So um, overall, I would probably characterize that as pretty large. Um, but you, know, you should still interpret it with some caution. So you could think of other factors that are potentially changing uh, differentially across these two sets of counties, the high and the low TSP reduction counties, that uh, could uh, explain the, the result. So the good news is that, in general, changes in TSP are uncorrelated with changes in other observable factors. So ideally, what we would like to have be the case is that everything that changes in the treated counties during this period also changes by the same amount in the control counties. Uh, and to the extent that they can look at like observable things in the census about these counties, that tends to be what they find, that, that these counties seem to be sort of following similar trends uh, in terms of their observable factors. The one exception, which you guys might have already been able to guess, uh, is that county per capita income uh, changes differently for the treated counties and the control counties. So if you think about it, that's not a big surprise, right? Like what we're looking at is we're comparing these manufacturing intensive counties during recession to counties that don't have much manufacturing in them. And the reason that you're seeing, basically the reason you're seeing a big uh, reduction in TSPs in manufacturing intensive counties, of course, is that the factories are down. If the factories are shutting down, that means people are losing their jobs. That means unemployment is going to be higher and wages are going to be lower, right? So there's sort of going to be, almost by construction, there has to be uh, a, a larger effect or a larger
so that's sort of, you know, that's good news, uh, but it shouldn't totally, um, it shouldn't like totally erase any doubts that you have about the result. Uh, and the reason is that, so remember, ideally what we would like to do is compare two units or two sets of, uh, two groups of individuals, or in this case, counties, that